Are we all back? Okay, great. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, as we can see from your enthusiastic responses, we hope you are feeling all fresh, energetic about the next session as well. Uh, for the next session, we have Dr. Shivani Shah with us. Shivani completed her master's degree from the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University in Vadodara, India in biochemistry. Her doctoral degree in immunology from the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Loyola University in Illinois, USA. She has had the opportunity to complete two postdocs, one at uh, the Loyola University Medical Center, again in US, and one at the Department of Pathology, University of Massachusetts, US. After returning to India, she joined Cactus Communications as a managing editor in the public publication support services team. She has now been with Heritage for more than five years and currently holds the position of a publications manager. In her role, she uses her strong scientific background and language skills to help authors prepare publishable manuscripts and guide them into successful publications. She's also obtained a certification from the Board of Editors in the Life Sciences, BELLS, in December 2013. And on that note, uh, I would not take any more time and would like to invite uh, Shivani. Over to you. Shivani, can you guys hear me? Great. I'll just turn my camera on for a little bit. You guys can see who you're listening to. And I'll turn it off you know, during my session. Great. All right. So let's turn off and start. So Shane has uh, you know, how you write, how do you write uh, a good lay summary or a research news story. And now in this next session, I'll be taking you one step ahead and tell you how you can actually make use of this. Right. So before I really start, I'll uh, give you a little bit of background. Hina has already told you a little bit about a little bit about me. But as uh, many of y'all, I was a researcher, and uh, all through my PhD and postdoc years, I've been uh, very passionate about my science. But always thought that it was all about bench work and all about the research. Never really thought too much about writing or communicating my science. Writing was necessary, right? Because we have to write, we have to publish, to graduate and move ahead. Um, but I never really, can you guys not hear me? I guess some people are having trouble. Okay, great, all right. So yeah, so writing for me was always hard and communication like beyond publication was never in my thoughts because it was never um it, it never seemed relevant at that time but ever since i've come back to india it's been about nine years now i've been with cactus communications the first you know seven years i was with the publication support services and that's when i really learned how to write and how and why um, the importance of writing well and publishing high, all those things really came to me um, much after my life as a researcher. And today, as part of the impact science team, I'm learning how important science communication is. Right? So we all know why we write, why we publish. Is that right? Now, Writing academic style is very different. We all know that, right? It's really hard to read a paper and understand sometimes what they want to say without spending quality time on the article. But it's not, but the science is there and it's all important. So communicating this well is, is one step further where you're making it more simpler and more fun for other people to read. And while you can't do that in an academic setting, while you can't do that in your publication, there are ways which you've kind of already learned uh, where you can make it easy and more engaging. 
Okay. So before I go any further, I'll start with a poll too. Neha, maybe you can help me put this poll up. Uh, the question is how many of you have already promoted your research somewhere, somehow, are thinking that promoting your research will increase visibility, but not sure whether research promotion can really help. While you guys answer this, I think many of us have already learned that promoting research will increase visibility. And I see that being reflected in your responses as well. So yeah, I think majority of you all know that or think that promoting research is important. Um, and some of you all have already promoted your research. So that's, that's really good. Maybe you can put down in, in comments how you've done that and what you've done so far. That's, that's interesting. Research, great, okay. Through Twitter mainly, very nice. Okay, great. So yeah, there are about 20% who have already promoted research uh, through ResearchGate, WhatsApp, blogging. Wow, nice. Twitter, LinkedIn, get an Insta and Facebook story, get it through press release, institutional newsletter. Oh, excellent. All right. WordPress. All right. So these are all things I'm going to talk about today and, uh, you know, get get all of you all familiar with these various sites and various pages that you can platforms that you can use to further bring you know talk about research and get out there all right so why do we promote research we promote research primarily you would think to increase citations okay, if you want to uh, you have this paper, you have excellent results, uh, you get that publication, what else can you do? So you promote research where more people read about it, and then you eventually uh, hope to increase your citations. Um, get visible. The more you talk about what you do, how you do it, where you're doing it, uh, all of these are playing a role in getting yourself visible, getting yourself noticed, getting your lab noticed, your institute noticed. If you are um, faculty somewhere, maybe this is a good way to draw attention to you know, students or postdocs across the country uh, who might you know, then get uh, interested in what you do and perhaps come, um, come to your lab someday. Uh, Naturally, yes, collaboration, and this is both academic as well as industry. So this is a good way to, to talk about your uh, interests, talk about your findings, and get perhaps industry involved where uh, you know, your findings can possibly lead to a patent down the road or even um, like a device or a product that can be marketed. A lot of Funding agencies uh, keep an eye out on social media. They are aware of what is being promoted, being talked about in the news. So yes, um, whatever you're promoting is going to help uh, or is likely to help your uh, you know, acquisition of grants and funding. All of this is going to make an impact, right, because um, whatever you are talking about, your research, your findings, eventually they are going to reach uh, people, policymakers, and hopefully down the road they will have an impact. Again, obviously this will depend on the kind of science you're doing and the field you're working in, uh, but all of these will 
help in making an impact. And yes, of course, sharing science, because that is primarily what we are all passionate about and what we want to talk about. Okay. How do you share your research? Well, one of the ways to do it is to use open access journals so people can freely read about your science. That's to collaborate. And lastly, to demonstrate impact. And what I'm going to talk about today is how you're going to get to that impact. Uh, we have a question here. I don't have findings yet. What we do is more infrastructure building at this stage. Uh, yes, you can talk about this, uh, Hannah. You can put it out in your social media, uh, you know, in your handles, and and get people to know what you're doing. Definitely, so that is uh, you don't have to wait for a final publication before you can talk about your research. Okay, uh, so how do you make that impact? Well, like I said, you can try to select journals that are open access. But in addition to selecting journals uh, that are open access, you can also select journals that disseminate your research further. So Shane's talked about several publishers who not only publish your work, but in addition, they put out these infographics and videos and then language summaries, uh, short form articles. These are all formats that publishers use to further promote the articles that they publish. So as a researcher, if you select such um, journals or publishers to publish in, uh, your work has a higher chance of getting disseminated through the publisher or the journal. Obviously, you will use your conferences as opportunities to talk about your research. So grab those moments where you use posters, where you, uh, you know, have a chance to do uh, an oral session use those opportunities because they are bringing you out there. Um, creating multimedia formats. And this is briefly, you know, something that Shane already talked about and a little more that I will talk about. But you can use all these different formats where you can simplify your research and make things clearer, make your findings clearer to a wider audience. And yeah, once you have all these collaterals, you're going to disseminate through either media or social media. All right, open access publication is definitely a good choice because more people can read your work and this will, land, uh, this will end with perhaps more citations um, for you. At the same time, you need to be a little wary about the kind of journals you're publishing in. So just because it's open access doesn't mean it's a good journal. So do your homework before you select the journal. Um, I will come to some of these in a little bit. So now now you can you can watch out for my next slides. All right, I'll keep going because otherwise I will not go forward. Uh, yeah, I've, yeah. Well, cost wise, we can't afford open access. That's a really good point, Aparna. And um, I understand the pains because I know these. Uh, sometimes don't come out of our, uh, you know, out of the funds that we have, but definitely it's something to keep in mind and weigh out the balances. Sometimes institutions help out. Sometimes you can get a waiver from the publisher. So keep these things in mind when you're selecting a journal. All right. So how do you disseminate your research? You have uh, these cool findings. What can you do? There are several things you can do. One of it is um, go through science media. And this is something that Shane has already brought up where you post your research news stories at, in certain platforms like Eureka Alert or Newswise or SciOrg. Now, these are all uh, hosting platforms where you put up um, your press releases and then journalists or reporters can take the stories from here and then pass on your findings uh, on their channels or through their media outlets. Okay. There is your own media, there is mass web media and uh, social media. All, all of these I will come to one by one. So for 
the first one that's science media when you're trying to think about where you can post your um, say press note or your press release you're going to need to consider multiple things one of the first things you want to consider is your field of science so think about where your research or your science is most talked about many of these platforms that are here today alert sci or spice all of these publish across multiple fields right and they're good starting places um for posting your rnss or uh, rns is short for press release i should just stick to press release all right uh you want to find sites that publish authentic news you want to publish uh where the news is, uh, you know where the platforms are reputed and they have credibility so any outlet that is good that that produce that publishes authentic news real news and in a manner that's not made up or unnecessarily you know made big that's where you want to go okay these are some of the samples some of the examples that that we've posted on for our, um for many of our authors you can see there's eureka alert there's newswise and all of these are unfortunately paid right so for many of us this may not be a good option and a good way to do it is to go through your institute if you want to post here however if you want to do it directly there are many other ways where you can perhaps go to different platforms that are not paid and that's where i'll come to for the next all right so you can use your own media platforms to get the word out there is um wordpress there is qs wow news there's medium all of these what they what what they allow you to do is to post directly and these are cost free so here some of the some of the uh, places where you can post is you can have your own web page now this could be a lab page it could be a university page or you might want to create your own um through wordpress and then there are other self publishing platforms like i mentioned there is medium there is qs wow news and for these uh you can just directly go ahead create an account and post your articles and these are a couple of uh things that we've posted right and what you notice time and time again is that along with these articles we put up these images or sometimes we have it draws attention to your article it makes the article more appealing so definitely this is one of the things that you should have you should consider having along with your you know your summary So Aditi says she gets emails from publishing houses who want to promote um, her research paper through lay summaries. You'll have to look at the publishing house and see see which publishing house this is and whether they're legit. I would also, you know, be careful about how it's done and for which you know is this a is this a published paper that you already have with them. or not that i think is very important so take a look at where they are coming from have they published your article and now they want to talk about it then i think that's a great opportunity um and you should definitely you know talk to them about it find out more uh all right any funding platform which encourages such ideas I'm not sure Renuka about this any funding platforms that encourage such ideas but they are all watching you so whatever you put out uh, is definitely like if you're blogging about it and it is it's got attention or if you're posting your uh, articles out somewhere and again if it's getting attention 
then yeah, the you know these are definitely pluses that the um, that the grantees are going to think about and they're going to you know they're going to consider when they're deciding whether to give you that grant. Yeah, there are audible formats. Uh, you can have you can do a podcast, uh, but that's slightly different format and it's more conversationalist. Uh, in a, it's more like a conversation. Uh, so that's a whole different ball game there. All right. Yeah, Gita, this is all there in this talk and I can share that separately as well. All right. So the third way is to go uh, mass media. And this is where you're going to reach out directly. So we're not going to go through a platform like Eureka Alert and hope that your article is picked up, but you can directly reach out to journalists or to news uh, outlets and try to see if they are interested in your work and try to get, uh, get them to either write your article or do an interview with you and write an article about either your findings or your lab as the focus. Okay, so one of the first things you want to consider is when to reach out to the press. When is your information, when, is, when are your results newsworthy enough when a, re, uh, when a journalist will be interested in it? Right. So when your results are new, they're novel, when they significantly advance uh, current science, the, uh, you know, advance uh, information or literature that's in your field, they're relevant. So they, you know, they're newsworthy in the sense that they're current and applicable to current times. So say, for instance, today, if you have a new finding, on um, on use of masks for COVID or on a vaccine or a treatment. They're very, very current. Now, this is something that perhaps many news outlets would be interested in. So that's 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 what makes it newsworthy, that it's current and relevant to today. Something that's unusual, something that's striking, something that's unique, uh, something that perhaps is against what is known, so it's new that way. Uh, controversial topics, well, I shouldn't say controversial topics, but something that's different than what's already known. And yes, if you have striking videos or photos, that's definitely going to add a lot more value. Okay, when do you not reach out to the press? So say you have findings that uh, only have an incremental advancement to current knowledge, current literature, uh, they may just be confirmatory. So while you're validating something that's already known and that's important, uh, they don't, they, your results aren't necessarily completely new and unique. Sometimes you're writing a review, so you're summarizing existing information, right? So in these cases also, uh, it's it's not going to be newsworthy where journalists or news outlets may be interested. So in all of these scenarios, you can definitely post these on your social media handles or use websites, your own blog sites or your uh, university website or your own lab website to put up and talk about these findings. Right? So it's not that you can't promote your work in these situations. You definitely can. but it's probably not going to make it to the newspaper. Okay, so how does a science news cycle really work, right? So you have newsworthy information. You have something really cool, you want, you want everyone to know about it. So one of the first things you're gonna do is to do a press release. And I've talked a little bit about how you're going to do a press release, uh, but also I'll, you know, I'll talk a little more about what else you can do. Once you do, once you have the press release, 
this information or this story is hopefully going to be picked up by a reporter, uh, editor of a magazine, maybe make it to TV and media, uh, internet, and then eventually get to the audience. So then you have everybody knowing what you're doing, everybody understanding what your findings are, perhaps your neighbors and friends will now all hear about um, what you found, right? Now, when you're trying to get that press release, right, the first thing you should really do is, all right, sorry, I have some samples over here. Um, I think the animation is, is lost in this format, but there are all these different you know, stories that we've written about, these press releases that we've done, that eventually have made it to big um, news outlets. Recently, we've had it published in The Guardian, we've had a story in The Asian Scientist, in The Independent, even Z News. So all of these uh, are opportunities how you can get out your story. So a press release should be um, done alongside publication. So the a good way is to time the press release, um, you know, within a day to ten days of your publication. That's going to get the most traction and it's going to have the most value. Okay. So yes, you can't do it before publication. You have to wait till the publication is out and the article is uh, available, and then and then only can you do the press release. Right. What is the use of science animated videos of our research articles? So videos again are a different format, wherein you are summarizing the entire story in a way that can be easily understood by a wider, wider audience. And it's, um, you know, it comes, it may come with narration uh, and make it more interesting and story-like for an audience. So that's how videos are good. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead. So the first thing you wanna do when you're trying to engage media is to contact your institutional PR office if your institution has one. Okay. You'll do that if, as a first step, and you know, like I just said, you want to time this before publication, so you know your paper is um, your paper is in revisions and it's in the final stage. You're probably proofreading um, the last, uh, you know, PDF that the journal has copy set and you're ready, you know it's going to come out soon. That's when you're going to start all this, maybe even earlier if you know your paper has been accepted and will be published uh, within a certain time frame. So one of the first things you're going to do is contact your institutional PR office. Now, if your institution doesn't have a PR office, you can cut that step and take matters in your own hand where then you can start with this cycle uh, on your own. Um, so here, the first step is to then look for journalists or outlets. And what I'm going to now take you through is just steps that you would, uh, should keep in mind how the cycle works uh, at your end for a researcher and tips on how to uh, handle each of these steps. All right. So we have a question here, can press release only be done for some research? that has already been done and proven. Uh, I ask this because if I need to part, if I need participants for my research, with the help of the press release on the basis of that. Um, I'm not sure I understand. So you're saying, uh, Shristi, you're saying, can press release only be done for some research that has already been done? Yeah, a press release is your, when you're talking about your findings. You're talking about something that has been published even. Okay, so it's not something you can do before publication. 
All right. So, what, how do you look for these? How do you look for these? Um, how do you look for journalists or news outlets? Well, you are reading news. You are reading the you know uh, articles at different sites, and you perhaps are already aware of the kind of news outlets that publish in your field of science. However, if you're not sure of where to go, you can uh, do some Google searches. You can search websites that are indexed by Google News. And again, you want to do some homework here. So you want to identify uh, sources or um, you know platforms that report accurately and responsibly. That's really important. And I, I want to stress this more and more because there's a lot of talk about how uh, journalists can you know, twist your story and write about uh, your research, but, but the final story that comes out is really not what you want it to be, or it's not what you want to you know, convey. So it's critical that you find and that you shortlist you know, good journalists uh, you know, who you think write well and who write um, accurately. And again, you're going to look for those that cover your field of science. That's again important. Okay. So if you have, um, if you're talking about, if you want uh, to have, uh, if your findings are relevant to children, you will find suitable sources uh, for, you know, for that age group. Okay, how do you connect with these reporters? Say you've shortlisted a few of these. How do you connect with these reporters? Well, one of the easiest ways is to connect with them through email. So you introduce yourself and you will tell them uh, who you are and why you're reaching out to them. You can find them sometimes on social media and then follow them, especially on places like Twitter, where you can see what these journalists write about and you know uh, which journalists are are good talking you know they write about uh, about news in your field and you can uh, follow them and get acquainted with them then share your idea i would recommend that you do it as a private message so that it's not out there in public and your story isn't uh, out there for everyone to read and before you do all this, make sure that your LinkedIn and Twitter profiles are updated because the journalist is going to check you out. For them, it's the other way, right? While you are validating the journalist uh, or the news outlet through whatever they are publishing or whatever they're writing about, it's also going to be reversed, right? So the journalist is, want to, is going to want to know where you are coming from. Uh, are, are you authentic? Is your research authentic? Why should they write about you? So they will do some of their background checks uh, before um, they probably even respond back to you. How do you pitch your story? So say you've connected with some reporters. Now you want to uh, write to them about your story. The way you're going to do it is you're going to write um, a good catchy subject line, right? You're going to customize each story based on a news outlet. So like I said earlier, uh, you're going to think about where the story is going to get published, the kind of audience you're going to read it, and then accordingly uh, twist your story, um, not twist necessarily, but just phrase it in a manner that makes sense for this audience. And then one of the most important things is to keep it concise whatever you write uh, you're not writing your entire paper you're not telling the journalist about all your findings you're basically giving them an idea of why they should write your story so keep your pitch short and start with the findings start with your key take-home message so again this is like your inverted pyramid where you want to start with the big bang first and then talk about 
how it happened, why it happened, and all the little details that can, you know, that make that story can come later. It's super, super important to keep it jargon free. Um, you want to write it simple so the journalist can understand, but at the same time, you want to make it relevant and interesting so that they want to write about you or about your work. And if you have any images, make sure to include these because again, you know, images and graphics, um, they say a lot without any text and those are going to have, uh, that's going to, they're going to play a key role in the decision making for the journalist, why to select your article. All right, and then, yeah, it would be a good idea to include your availability because the entire news cycle is, is kind of short and it's important that, that the journalist can take your story and quickly write about it. So they're going to come to you and say, if they're interested, they're going to come to you and say, hey, can I meet you uh, today maybe or tomorrow and we can just talk about it so I can write this. This is relevant. I'm very interested. I want to write it. Uh, uh, I have to put out this article uh, by you know the end of this week. So it's likely that they may want to hurry and talk to you very soon. So include your availability within your pitch itself. There are different kinds of interviews. So say a journalist is interested in in what you know what you've what you've talked about in your pitch and there are different ways that you can have an interview. One of the biggest ways is a TV interview. Say you have really interesting news and they want to do a TV interview. There could be a radio interview or uh, something that's probably most uh, common or especially in today's COVID world where it's going to actually be a print or an online um, interview, perhaps through Zoom call. So Jyoti has a question here. She says, how does one tackle the problem of making the findings of basic research interesting, especially when any potential applicabilities, societal relevance may not be immediately obvious. So Jyoti, this is this is a tough part, right? This is this is a crux of how you convey your story, how you make it interesting. A good way is to use, is to think of an analogy, or is to think of um, a metaphor, something that people can relate it to. It may not be something that's right there. Sometimes you may have to um, go the extra mile in thinking about how your research can be interesting to somebody else. It could be something very basic. It could be uh, biochemistry, basic research, right? So making this into something that's interesting will really depend on how you think about your research and where you think it's going. So those are big picture things. You need to think big picture rather than the nitty gritties. Why is this research? Why is this research uh, important? Why do you want people to know about it? That is the question. Why do you want to share it? What do you think it's going to give to the community? So if you can answer those, you're going to come around to figuring out how to talk about it and how to make it more fun. And yeah, it's likely that not every finding is uh, is newsworthy, right? Not every finding can be made. Uh, I'm sure every finding can be made simpler, but it may not be. It may not have direct application, and that's okay. So that's that's a choice you have to make, and that's a, that's a decision making. When is it going to be interesting? You go to the news only if it's going to be interesting to the community, where the community can get something out of it. Not every research. If not, perhaps not every new research can be uh, can make it to TV. Right? So while you can write about it, you can write a press note about it, and it will be picked up within the science community, within within your field. So it's not necessarily it's going to go everywhere, but it may you know it may still get traction within your science fields, within your science community. Uh, so. It's not like an all or none scenario in any case. <laughs> right, so for all of these, yes, Kamal, that's very true. Basic findings are pillars 
uh, they are the foundation of light research and it's important to talk about them. How you do it is a, is a challenge and that's something that will come, you know, as and as, in, as you keep writing and keep reading and as and as you can keep on thinking about the big picture. Okay. Okay, so here you have yourself an interview and here you've, you've you know, you're sitting with the journalist and you're talking about your research. And uh, the journalist is not really sure about what, you know, what your research is. It's still complicated for the journalist. And the journalist is nice enough to tell you, hey, story is still complicated, but you aren't able to break it down further or you haven't thought about it enough. And you're like, just throw in that metaphor out there and you know, you can figure it out. But it doesn't always work. Like, it's not necessary that the journalist is gonna get what you're saying. And this is gonna come out badly for you because at the end, the journalist is just gonna write something that may not be relevant or that may not, may not be accurate. So as, as, a, um, as a researcher coming up with this story, it's very important that you make the journalist understand what your story is about. Don't depend on the journalist. Don't depend on their understanding to break it down in the right manner. Okay. So one of the one of the things that you, you need to do for an interview when you're preparing for it is learning about the host and the audience. So you learn about journalist for one, you read about the journalist, you figure out what the journalist is going to understand, what the journalist is going to, uh, or how much journalists will understand. And then you want to think about the audience, who is going to read the story at the end. And accordingly, you're going to summarize your key points. Accordingly, you're going to simplify your work so that both the journalist and the audience can understand. Uh, you can use stories, you can use metaphors, you can use anecdotes. All of these are great ways to simplify your work. So it may, it may be basic research, okay? it may be basic findings, but it's a manner in, you know, it's the manner in which you explain these findings. It's how you break down your science. So metaphors is a great way. You know, one of I'll give you an example. Um, there was there was a press note that we wrote where we had to explain that this molecule, uh, you know, spins in two different ways. And the way we explained that was uh, one that it spun like a like a top, okay? and two think of it as a pencil going around your thumb. So these were just ways to explain how the spinning happens. These were metaphors that we use in terms of a spinning top and a pencil that's you know moving, spinning around your thumb. And these are just ways to simplify your work. And you'll notice that no matter how fundamental your science is or how basic your science is, what makes it complex is the fact that you can't, or you think you can't break it down. But there are ways where you can break it down. There are ways you can, you know, make your story more interesting, even though it's not all about finding a treatment or finding uh, a vaccine or something very cutting edge uh, that you think is cutting edge normally. Even basic science can be made more fun and more interesting. Okay. Uh, like preparing for anything that you do, practice. You practice with peers, you can record it, you can practice in front of the mirror, make sure that whatever you're talking about makes sense um, to others and you sound good when you record it, you look good when, you know, when you're doing this in front of the mirror. All right. Now, these are some of the questions that you can prepare for. So expect these. Uh, to happen, I mean, to be to be asked of you, right? So one of the first things is, why did you do? Why did you work on this? Why why did you study this? 
What are your key findings? Was anything different? Did something jump out at you? What are the long-term implications? What are, uh, you know, how is this going to affect our community? So where is this outreach? What are you, uh, what should we do about it? You have these great findings. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to talk about it in this in this article, but 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 why? Why should we be doing this? Another question is: Do these findings affect policy, or why should these be funded? And finally, what's the next on the agenda? What else is there for you to address, or for anyone else to address in this field? Okay. So it really boils down to the why you studied the what you found, and how is this going to impact society or policy? And the last is what's next, what's in the future. Okay. So these things are, these are normal questions that one should prepare for any possible interview. Okay. Now I mentioned earlier that there were different kinds of interviews you can have. You could have a TV interview, a radio interview, a print interview. Uh, for all of these, there are different things that you need to keep in mind. Right. So one of the first things is appearance. When you're doing a TV interview, your appearance matters okay, because you're going to be recorded wholesome. You're going to, people are going to see you as you are. So you have to make sure that you dress well, that um, uh, that that you position yourself well, your posture is good, and uh, you know some of the things that you may want to think about is what you're wearing, how it's going to look on camera, and things like that. Uh, another really important part is location. So many times a TV interview uh, would be held at a studio somewhere, but if that's not happening, and say uh, it, you know the recording, the shooting for the interview is going to happen on location, which is, say, at your institute or in your lab, then you want to make sure uh, that whatever you are displaying behind you or whatever, you know, whatever scenes that are going to be shot uh, are all things you want to be aired. Okay? So keep these things in mind when you're preparing for a set TV interview. For a radio interview, it's slightly different, right? So no one's going to see you. Uh, but it's important in this scenario that you that you are seated uh, in a place that's quiet like when the recording is done that your voice the tone of your voice everything is clear so no one's going to see you they're only going to hear you so you want to make sure that you're audible and that there are no background sounds okay. make sure that your responses are short and crisp so that they are clear and concise. Now, say you don't have a TV or a radio interview, but rather it's going to, this interview is for something that the journalists might write about you. Okay. So may, they might just want to um, put out something equivalent to a press note something equivalent, but, but they are writing it. The journalist is going to write. So they're going to interview to write this article. And this can be done either in person or online, over the phone. It could be any of these ways. And today, most likely, it's probably going to be a Zoom call because that's most convenient for everyone in the loop. And these are some tips that you want to think about, you know, um, for an online interview or even for a print interview because for a print interview they're going to write about you but along with that write-up they might want photo shots of you or they might need your images and videos uh, that accompany the article so be sure to have these ready they ask for it you have them again like like you would for a radio interview make sure you're in a quiet room with no background sounds that's going to affect clarity of whatever you're saying. And if they're recording you, right, if they're recording your video, or if they're even just seeing you, um, you know, it's important that you appear well uh, on screen. So think about uh, 
camera angle, the background, the lighting, right? So here, how should your camera be placed, right? Your, on the, on the top left, you see that the camera on your laptop maybe is right up in your face. It's very close to you. And the angle is not flattering. So you would rather move back a little so that there's more of you being seen. And the camera is at eye level, okay, so that your view is very clear. And you may have to put your laptop on books or something to uh, aid, you know, getting to this angle. So that's going to help you position yourself well. Um, make sure that your background is nice. It, it could be an empty wall, that's fine. Uh, but make sure there's not too much clutter behind. Lighting, you want to see how the light comes on your face. So, a good, you know, an example of how it should not be is on the left here, where the lighting is on one side only and it gives you a light on one side um, and the other side is dark. Or the light is behind you and then you appear as a silhouette. You can't really make out how, you know, how, how you are. So a good practice here is to have the light come from the front. And so then your face is well lit and your uh, camera view is clear and you know, visible. Okay. okay, so some of the do's when you're thinking of a press release, when you're thinking of an interview, uh, is the timing. You must time the press release well. Respect the journalist's deadline because you want to make sure that whatever you know your press release or your interview is timed well with what's happening now. Uh, in case you aren't able to meet this deadline, uh, say you're busy or you're away at a meeting, you could suggest uh, other sources um, for. You know, other sources could be from somebody from your team, from your lab, who could do the interview with the journalist. Uh, ensure that you have concise notes ready, notes, thoughts on how you want to answer some of you know, the obvious questions. Ensure that the journalist is understood. Okay? So it's really important here. If you're using a metaphor, I think someone asked here, uh, what if your metaphor is misconstrued or it's not understood well, make sure that whatever you are using makes sense. Okay, you can't just use any metaphor and expect the journalist to understand. You can't use a Star Trek metaphor for your cancer research. Okay? So think about it. You have time before you do the interview. This part, this kind of becomes part of your preparation where you think about how you want to simplify your research. Think about what is going to make sense to the person who is listening to you. And yeah, offer videos or photos wherever relevant um, for the highest impact. Okay. Some things you want to keep in mind uh, is that whatever you say during your interview is, is on the record. Okay. Assume, don't assume anything is off the record. Because what happens sometimes is that we talk about a lot of things in an interview and we may say, hey, you know, this is off the record, but it may not actually happen that way. So the journalist may like what you said off the record and use that. We don't want that. Sometimes a lot of these misunderstandings happen when, when your interview isn't clear. So make sure Whatever you're saying, think of it as, you know, people are going to, the journalist is going to use anything that you say. Expect, don't expect to get the, you know, get to review the story once written. Uh, often there is no time for that. And in, in media, this isn't the norm. So as researchers, we need, you know, we, we assume that things will come back to us to review. But that doesn't really happen in media. So be careful with what you write. Be careful with what you tell the journalist and make sure the journalist really understands. Okay, so here we have some
some questions and comments on uh, scientific language in native, uh, you know, in different languages. So while these are uh, these are important uh, to reach down to more, uh, you know, more people to reach down to a wider audience. That's a whole different arena. Okay, so most of most of what we are doing today is first and primarily perhaps talked about in English because that has the most global outreach. However, things are translated, things are dubbed perhaps if it's a video into different languages. Okay? And that's definitely something that can be done. So as in when you translate into different languages, you need to make sure that those translations are accurate and your story is still being conveyed in the right manner. Okay. Okay. All right. So just to summarize, you're going to break down your research so that a lay audience can understand. You want to make it interesting and to the point where um, it's newsworthy. Right? So people are interested in reading about it and interested in hearing about it. Make it relevant so that it's about today, it's about things that are happening today or are likely to happen tomorrow. All of these things is going to um, increase the readability of your article and make it more interesting to more people and therefore help in really disseminating your science out. Okay. Avoiding controversies. So yeah, there will be points where perhaps um, the journalist will ask you questions that you don't know the answer to. So instead of saying something that you don't know, just tell them that you know someone else, maybe you know the media relations team or maybe somebody else uh, on your team might be a better person to address this question and that you can get back to them later uh, but in addition to that make you know do your homework so that you can avoid these controversies if your findings uh, are overlapping with someone else's or if they're slightly differing from uh, what another lab has already published and talked about do your homework so you know what's coming so you can perhaps sufficiently address those questions that the journalist is putting out to you. Avoid negative statements. And you don't want to put down anyone else's work. Don't speculate. And don't talk about things that perhaps you don't know. But come back to your key message. Bring them back to what you want to convey and bring them back to your story. And at the end of it, you know, stay calm because no matter what you are talking, you're on air or you're in that interview and you want to come out uh, as the expert. So keep your cool at all times. Now, I've talked about using science media, using your own media, you know, approaching mass media. And now the last bit is on social uh, media okay i see some questions here uh, maybe i'll address them later in the best interest of time so i'll come to those at the end right so let me talk to you about social media i think most of you all already are on these handles they you know you're already talking perhaps about your research there how many of you all have you know used social media to talk about your research we just a yes on perhaps which uh, network, which platform you use. Only LinkedIn. Okay. Twitter. Right. Facebook. Insta. Great. So, yeah, so you guys are already there blogging. Um, research kit, yeah, sure, why not? All right. So, when you're talking about social media, right, you understand one of the main reasons why you talk to social media is because 
it's used okay people are people are on social media and as of last year there are estimated 3.6 billion users worldwide so people are on social media people are reading uh, people are watching and this is only likely to increase uh, as the years go by okay. so it's not just your daily activities or your you know daily happenings that you talk on social media you can also talk about your research okay so there are different platforms right linkedin there's twitter facebook and primarily i think if you use all these you know the top three those are the key ones okay? linkedin is where you kind of put yourself out there you have a formal profile um, and you're connected to other people who are professionally connected with you and here you can put up a summary of your paper accompanied by a link and what it's going to do is all your professional uh, connections are going to read about it on twitter you're going to you know that's where you chatter you're going to talk about uh, findings or in bite-sized portions you're going to talk about uh, it's going to be a really small summary where you're going to grab someone's attention to go read the paper okay? and you can do this either on your personal handle or university handle uh, and a lot of these journals and publishers are also on these platforms right so they are on twitter they're on facebook and instagram and they also put up their publications so if you're one of those publications it might be that they will put up um, summaries of your paper or you know small graphics or um, even videos of your paper so these are great ways to use social media to talk about your science and to really push your findings out to a wider audience okay and if you have a video you have youtube you can post your uh, video there along with the description and that's also going to definitely add to the number of people who are going view um, and then perhaps even go and read your paper and you know cite your paper down the road all right so a few things that linkedin uh, is really good for uh, one of it is that it makes you know it allows you to be visible in a professional setup it's a good place to network and collaborate with other people you know, both in and outside your field or you know outside your field maybe just relevant to what you're doing you can tailor your profile here and uh, tailor it towards your career interests uh, career um, tailor it towards your career progression so and it's also a place where your cv is almost ready always right you as if you keep your profile updated your CV is always ready and anyone uh, who is trying to find out more about you, maybe to collaborate or maybe uh, even to come interview you, it could be a journalist, they check out your LinkedIn page, they're likely to know a little bit about who you are and what you're interested in. So for those who aren't very familiar with LinkedIn, uh, you know, there is a LinkedIn headline and here you can make a statement about what you do and why you're unique. You can have you know update your profile summary and make sure that your profile is complete at all times include a photo because like i said people are going to come to your linkedin page and well check you out i guess so that they know who who they're dealing with make sure that whatever you're posting is is positive okay? you want to make sure uh, that you're seen in a good light and yeah make sure to update your profile regularly twitter is generally used to engage with people again network collaborate and here you can follow groups so uh, i met this uh, assistant professor once who wasn't able to keep up with you know all the happenings in his field and he, he got onto twitter and he started following certain labs and certain groups uh, in his field and what he realized is that he's like this is the best way for me to keep tabs of what's happening it's easiest so i don't have to go sift through everything that's on pubmed 
And likewise, when you are commenting, when you are tweeting on Twitter, the same people are going to follow you, are going to share uh, whatever you are tweeting and retweet. And that's pretty much how the cycle goes in sharing your research and disseminating it out there. Okay, so I think most of you all are familiar with this, but uh, first you go to you know search and follow uh, people who are in, you know who are tweeting about things that interest you. You can tweet about anything to get visible so that other people see you. Use hashtags, post pictures, and yeah, when you're uh, talking about another journal or a scientist, make sure you include their names in so that these are all connections and ways to build uh, in your uh, networking scene. Facebook is generally uh, used to keep in touch, but you can also have a professional page up there. And again, this is something that people can see. Again, a place where you can put up your stories, put up your research, put up your findings, and uh, you know, thereby have more people come read about what you do. All right, um, I think, yeah, post often, comment often, and use links for longer posts. So if, say you have a longer article, you can just write a short summary, but again, make that interesting and catchy. So for all of social media, really, what you, you know, you've got to figure out what you want to talk about. Again, it's about simplifying your research and breaking it down into something short and interesting. And you can use hashtags. Uh, mention people whose attention you want. You can use visuals and talk about your research journey. These are all things that's going to help people uh, read about what you do and understand, talk about it in their own ways to their friends. So I think this is fairly clear how social media will help you. Um, but yeah, it's going to it's going to allow you to build your contacts, promote your research for funding, you know, and stay updated in the field. All right. So a good research communication strategy really is to do a little bit of all of this. Is to have your press note out, try to get that interview, talk about it in social media, talk about it through your websites. <clears throat> And just have that cycle going so that more people are coming in the loop, more people are reading about your work. And this is something that we do for our, uh, for our authors. We kind of help them get there through various steps. All right? So one of the first things we do is that we help them um, shortlist journalists or news outlets, platforms where their uh, stories can be published and it's simplified like i said so that ev everyone everyone can understand um what the research is about so we help do that as well and that's something that you as a researcher should be thinking about too what this does is increase your citations and increase opportunities for research collaboration funding etc if you have graphics, if you have infographics along with your article, it's going to go a long way in increasing your altmetric score. So this is something that Shane um, you know, talked to you about, what an altmetric alt score is and what it does. Uh, this is just an example of you know, what we've done, um, what we've seen for some of our clients. So over a period of time when you study, all the articles that we've posted out and those that have gone out on news channels, you can see that the altmetric scores have increased. And these are just average scores over multiple papers. And you can see that on an average, the altmetric score goes up 15 times. And this is really where you're thinking about why you want to put your story out. Is that, yeah, simple increase altmetric score, meaning that more people are reading about your science. All right, so the last few minutes, what I want to do is have you guys uh, do this short activity. Right? Uh, this here is just an abstract. 
It's an article published in the Journal of uh, Bone and Joint Surgery. And what I want you guys to think about is how you would simplify this technical abstract and put it up on Twitter. So if you are posting about this on Twitter, how would you break it down? So take a few minutes to read it. And what I have here on the next slide, I'll put it up in a, in a few seconds, are some options. But before I do that, maybe you can just put down in a nutshell here how you would break down this story. While you guys are reading, maybe I'll answer one of these questions. Uri is asking how I made this transition from academia to science communication. Well, it's been a journey, I'll tell you. Uh, but it's something that came to me, and it's something that I enjoy today, but I never thought I would enjoy back then. So it's all about getting the right exposure, learning about the right things. And it's just literally learning, learning, learning. So first I learned how to write, then I learned how to communicate. And it's all by practice. It's all by experience. It's, it's all about um, really understanding what you're reading. So what kind of experience in my PhD postdoc helped me at least make this transition is my ability to say break down this abstract that's up here. I can do this in a few, you know, few minutes and get, get an idea of what the paper is about and how uh, how this was done. So how the research was carried out what the key findings are and really what my take home message is. And breaking down information, simplifying it is basically the crux of science communication. How you would simplify that really is the essence. All right, so I have some answers here. Um, Methane blue found useful to detect infected cells okay do for differential bio staining films yeah these are good but yeah so selective visualization of biofilms on biological surfaces that seems to be the most accurate so when you're breaking down information you have to remember to put it in context right so this publication uh, where it is published, where is methylene blue being used? Where are these biofilms? So it's kind of important that when you break it down, break down your science or break down your content, you at least have a few basic, most important keywords. So when someone has done this research, it's not just about the methylene blue and the biofilms. But I think the important part is that these biofilms were on the... Um, on the implants, and that's why you're detecting it. Okay. Oh, I like this. The new black lamp to detect invisible biofilms. Nice, so that's really cool. That's definitely catchy. Visualize biofilms on implants. That's that's good, Mona. That works. <laughs> nice, Shantala. That's 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 really neat. I like it. Only the conclusion should be enough. So Shreya, if you read, okay, I'll come to that in a bit. Okay, great. So now what I'm going to do, I think most of you all have come up with some really cool, uh, cool options. Uh, 
what I'm going to show you is some options now. Okay, I want you guys to read this and tell me what would really work best on Twitter. Okay, take this poll. Uh, Neha, if you can help me put up this poll. Which of these options would you want to put up on Twitter? Okay. Okay, great. I think most of y'all are answering A. Some are doing B. Some are doing D. Yes, I see that. You guys have come up with some good ones. So the goal of, of having a Twitter post is not just about giving out the crux. Also, it's about getting people to go read your paper, especially uh, for people in the science community or people who are in the field, other surgeons maybe or you know, other doctors who might find this interesting. So, so you, you're always going to think about who's going to read this and how they're going to take it forward. One of the goals as a, um, as a publisher would be to get people to come read the paper. One of the goals as a researcher also is to come read the paper because you want people to go cite your research at the end. Right? So, but right. So I have uh, I have a lot of people who've answered, and majority of them have chosen A, which is the way I would go. Right? There's no right or wrong, but A is what where I would go with. Simply because uh, if I had to choose between A and B, let's say that if I had to choose between A and B, I would go with A. And the reason is that I've got, I've talked about where this is published. I've talked about, uh, so JPJS is a journal. Um, I've, I've kind of hashtagged some keywords and I've got the crux of the information out there. I've brought in methylene blue. I've brought in resistant bacteria, which is a problem at hand. And I'm talking about the bone implants, right? Where, where these, where these resistant bacteria are. Okay, now why is B not so good? Or why can B or how can B be better? So the first part of B is fine. Okay, here we are bringing in the journal, we are bringing in uh, the setup. But the conclusion or the last bit is very technical. Okay, so NB is an effective disclosing agent. What is disclosing agent? For S. aureus and P. aeruginosa biofilms. Again, this is technical, right? Um, and we may allow surgeons to see biofilms and may allow for enhanced to, to what? I don't even know what this means. Okay. So, so this last bit is something that I would not use. And that's why the conclusion of the abstract is not a good way to talk about in social media. You want to make it easy for people to understand, easy for people to read and perhaps get excited about your research to go read the paper. Okay, so A isn't that great. A is just laying it out. And yes, some of y'all have had some amazing ways, uh, very interesting ways of talking about it. So well done there. And I think uh, you guys know now what needs to be done to talk about your research. Okay, so just kind of at the end, Unless you find the right language, your science will end up in the lab. Okay, this sounds really ominous, but yes, you have to find the right way to communicate the science. Uh, and like Shane said, you know, the grandma test is the best one. You go talk about your work to your grandma, to your family, to your friends and neighbors. And if they are understanding what you're doing, then great, you've got your language right. And this then can be communicated through so many different ways uh, that are both interesting and exciting. Okay. All right. So yeah, social media, media, you can use science talks also, 
right? The conferences to talk about your work. And even there, you want to talk simple. You want to uh, make it easy for the audience to understand because not everyone in the audience is probably going to be from your field. So just remember who the audience is and tailor whatever you are talking based on the audience. All right. And then as a last note, um, yeah, these are all the ways you can distribute your work. And I would recommend that as a researcher, you try to do, do it all. You don't have to just use one way. And sometimes one way is easier than the other. You can always start from there. And as you get more comfortable, more confident, you can branch out. These are just some resources that I use for these. So for more reading, you can go to these uh, websites and read some very interesting articles about science communication, about uh, you know, about social media or about interviews and just how you can engage with the media. And yeah, I guess forum is now open for questions. Please switch on your cameras so that we can start with the questions. Also, uh, uh, may I also request our participants to please confirm if it's OK if we extend by a couple of minutes, maybe 15 minutes, to have the Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Shane, can we have you on the camera as well, please? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So, yeah, uh, I will start with a question for Shane. Um, since all we hear as researchers uh, when talking about publishing our work, it's impact factors and alt metrics is something new for our audience as well. So we have questions on, uh, is the scientific community already accepting alt metric as a substitute for impact factors? Uh, is it better at promoting science communication? And the last bit is, can it be controversial because somebody might manipulate the social media presence of the article? Okay, okay. so uh, okay, so that I think yeah, so the three parts to that question: Is it being accepted by the scientific community? Uh, yes, it is. Is it a replacement for impact factor and citation index? No, it is not. It's not a replacement. It's a supplement, but a very good supplement. And why is it a good supplement? Because it tells you about the impact of research real time, which citation index and uh, what citation index and uh, impact factor can't tell you. I'll give you an example, right? Uh, I could subjectively, like maybe six, seven years ago, I could subjectively tell you that a paper that talks about uh, a breakthrough in the genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was important. I could subjectively tell you that's an important finding, right? But today I can objectively tell you that it's important because it's being discussed on social media, because it's come up in the news, it's it's being quoted in policy documents, and that's what impact, uh, that's what altmetric measures essentially. So it's not a replacement yet. I don't think journals are ready to let go of impact factor and citation index. All right, but uh, you know uh, they're not ready to let go of it. But altmetric is, is is an excellent supplement to that. Now, are there any perils of people boosting the content for social media or overstating it? Let me put it this way. All right. Uh, isn't there more for the researcher to lose by overstating their case in terms of the results? Right. There is that. That's that's the pitfall because there have been some very very high profile cases, especially in in Japan, uh, with with researchers. Uh, you know claiming uh, certain very kind of, uh, how, how would you put it, certain sensational results, as a matter of fact. But being found out or getting that piece of research detracted or people labeling you as somebody who's overstating it, that has too many far-reaching consequences and implications for your career progress. So I don't think anyone would take that risk. Yeah, some people are better at wording their results. Some people are can take advantage of, of their skills in terms of, you know, explaining that better in, in, in their writing. But I don't think anyone would 
probably willingly take the risk to kind of kind of fake their results or overstate their results because yeah i i think that's that's too much of a peril for their career i would i would say that's that's my opinion on those those three things yeah thanks um uh, i think a very valid point there uh, sheen uh, i would uh, come back to you with one more question so people ask since you deal with uh, academic journals and you talked about how they also want to adopt alternative formats of talking about research to make it more accessible so we have a question where people ask how uh, common has this become i mean do journals have their in house teams that are going to help you free your work of jargon or uh, turn it into a format that okay. is more accessible so there are uh, okay so a lot of things I, i keep saying pandemic because uh, it has impacted almost every sphere of life including academic publishing right so up until recently a lot of journals it's most of the ones that 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 i speak to right a lot of them a lot of the societies they have been using an in-house team to do it right and they used to do it only for a select set of papers so for example the journal editor would pick the paper that was most relevant in that particular issue or thought was the best so called paper of that particular issue and then they basically reach out to us their in-house team reaches out to us to simplify the paper into an insane infographic or convert it into a video they kind of reach out to people like me to kind of help them people like me and shivani to help them kind of convert it into a different alternate content format now uh with the whole pandemic some of them not all of them but some of them are turning into an author pay model where they are telling authors that if you want to promote your research we'll give you that option because a lot of authors come back to journals and say why did you pick paper a and not my paper why did you pick his paper not my paper why is my paper less important than that paper so they've actually turned on uh, they all they've turned that around uh, as a revenue model in some cases and they've said you want to do research promotion then you go ahead and you know you can opt for these services it's up to you there we are not associated with the service but if you want to promote you can go ahead and promote wiley is an example of where this is happening quite quite often with their journals where they're saying you want to go ahead and promote your research you go ahead and utilize these services and promote your research but with academic societies like the very highly prestigious academic societies they still reserve the right to promote the paper that they think is relevant to that particular issue they still reserve the right to do that it's not something the authors can choose etc etc and in some cases like the really high impact factor journals who have the budget uh like the new england journal of medicine or say the american association of neurology they choose around 6 7 papers per issue that they want converted into a video or converted into infographic and then they help the authors the authors don't do anything they just sub- the paper is published and they just create the infographic as a as as a gesture for the author So so yeah both both models now exist and the author pay model has has come about because a because journals sometimes get accused of bias and secondly because of the pandemic and a lack of bandwidth uh, you know journals don't want to incur the cost anymore so they're letting authors take yeah. care of that themselves Thank you thank you that was quite informative uh Shivani uh since you were talking about you know how to talk about your research on social media uh people wonder when is the right time to talk about it and how much to reveal i mean uh, uh, do i risk my uh, study if i divulge too much bef- uh, about the findings before it's published yeah scooping is always a major concern right and we're always worried about someone else picking off uh but if you talk about it after it's published right and you're talking about that story then that's already published that's already out there there's no question of scooping and there's no harm in talking about it to whatever extent uh that you want if you're talking about your research before it gets published and that's that's a different ball game and that's something i wouldn't even i wouldn't recommend you can create a buzz if you want to around it but perhaps closer to publication and not not any time right in the front because you may have cool findings and why would you talk about it in the whole well not why would you talk about it in an ideal scenario you should be able to talk about it but yeah you align it with your publication and that's going to give you the best out of it so it's going to add to the value of your publication it's a it's a cycle right so i have this publication i talk about it on social media uh 
the journal talks about it on social media and then that's when that's when the true buzz about it really comes about that's when perhaps uh, you might get asked for an interview if it's really interesting and out there so yeah time it with your publication right after it uh, a lot of times we recommend that you post multiple times so say you've just got your publication today the paper is available online today you start on linkedin and twitter and put up your um, links along with the article link so that people are going and linking themselves they're going and reading the paper and then say a week later you put up another post on it and then that's going to have more people come and look at it right so so yeah time it with your publication anything you do any kind of science promotion that you're doing on your research findings time it with your publication Uh, about the journal embargo policies. So sometimes that is a tricky area, according to some people. Uh, you don't really know when to go ahead with the press release or talking about your research on social media. So how to deal with that? So the embargo is really about the paper itself. 99% of the time, it's the paper that you can't put out. Okay. So if the paper is available online and you're linking it to that, then that's fine. But if there's an embargo for say six months or a year or whatever, where you can't reveal your entire paper, you just link it to the abstract. So you're just saying, hey, I've got this paper published, but if you want to read it, well, you're going to have to go to the publisher. Uh, and you can let out, you know, whatever is, I mean, you're already summarizing your study in the abstract. So that's available for sure. And you can add in little more tidbits to make it more interesting. I'm sure no publisher will say no because that's just going to increase readers coming to their page and increase downloads for them so yeah you can definitely talk about in a summarized format during the embargo period you can't reveal the whole article you can't post the entire pdf somewhere but yeah, yeah. so yeah again uh, you already uh, preempted my next question so it is about posting full text of your paper if it's not available otherwise through the journal i mean you would maybe feel an ownership of the paper this is my paper so i can post it is it ethically okay to do that that depends on your publisher it totally depends on your publisher and what whether this is open access well if it's open access you won't feel the need to publish it yourself Right? But uh, if it's if it's not open access, then then it's copyrighted with the publisher. So to do that would be technically unethical. She, yeah. That's good. We say it is not like the publishers at all. They don't make any bones about it, right? Uh, moreover, I think there's been a very uh, high-profile case with regard to SciHub, if I'm not mistaken. Where Elsevier has is taking them to court now. Uh, Elsevier and Wiley are both taking them to court because of making you know research papers uh, available uh, you know free of cost or making them available now. I understand the arguments and I completely understand the argument that uh, it, it's the researcher's work. Firstly, right, the journal is just putting it on its platform. But the thing is, the journal legally has owns a certain level of copyright. Right? The journal legally owns a certain level of copyright, and for that purpose, we have to kind of respect the fact that uh, uh, the copyright is owned by the journal legally. Right? If you don't respect that copyright, then the journal will just say, don't publish here, then go somewhere else, publish open access if you have to. Secondly, uh, the model for accessing publications, right? Uh, you know, the model for uh, accessing publications is such that your institute pays for that subscription to that particular journal. Every institute should be paying for subscriptions and you access it through your library. That's essentially the model that works. But that model is not something that's feasible in all countries, especially developing countries. It's, it's not a feasible model. And because subscription fees are extremely, extremely high. right? So putting your paper out there, putting your PDF out there, there are certain rules to sharing your PDF. You can share it, for example, if you're taking a lecture. You are free to share your paper. You are free to share the paper as a PDF to your students in a limited capacity, right? Because it's not being used, utilized for any commercial purposes. You can print it out, Xerox copy it, share it as much as you want. I mean, that's how all of us got through our master's courses and most of us through our PhD coursework as well, right? So you can share it like that offline. You can share it like that informally. It's not an issue. It's not. It's not an issue as such. 
but but what you have to try to understand basically is that uh, what you essentially have to be able to understand essentially is that uh, it's against the law. You can't just go ahead and put the PDF on research kit unless your publisher has an open access policy that allows for it. Right. And by doing that, you will put yourself in a spot. The journal might blacklist you. Uh, and like I said, ResearchGate isn't in the clear about sharing this information in that manner. So you'll be careful when you're navigating those sort of terrain. So yeah, just, just to let everybody know. So um, uh, the next question is for you, Shane. Uh, we have a lot of people asking us, uh, you know, uh, you can always talk about applied research or something that has immediate uh, real world implications easily compared to something that is more fundamental in nature. So how do you simplify things there? How do you make it relevant for the public? And how do you tread that fine line of not over oversimplifying it and yet staying clear of the jargon? Research that is largely pure, and and some fields are more difficult than others. I, I would I would say that, right? Uh, and it does require a level of imagination, right? Uh, to give you a good example, Schrodinger's cat. Why do we know about Schrodinger's cat? We know about Schrodinger's cat because that thought experiment was necessary to explain his theory, right? Uh, so. Uh, the key there is to use a certain level of imagination to make it accurate. Similarly, the manner in which Einstein explains, say, relativity. All right. Uh, he, the, the, there is one analogy of, uh, what do you call it, people being in a train and thing. And even the analogy is complicated, actually. It's not really a straightforward analogy uh, where he goes on to explain the theory of relativity. So it requires a level of imagination. Right. You have to think about your research and you have to kind of Again, I, I said this during my during my talk. You have to uh, add a narrative to it. You have to add a narrative to it, right? I get it. You kind of got to a particular point in your discovery with regard to something fundamental or something basic, right? But how did you arrive at that point, or or you know why 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 is that a possibility, or how is that a possibility? Maybe you should ask yourself that question: How as many times as you need to till you crystallize it to like a very simple idea, right? No matter how complicated, you can actually crystallize something to its most basic fundamental unit, right? Without oversimplifying it. So you have to understand what the most fundamental unit is of, of, of that discovery, and then think about building a narrative around it. And that's where uh, you need to kind of, uh, that, that's where you need to kind of think about how it functions, how, how that would be explained to somebody in the real world, right? So I think that's how you, that's how you kind of con contextualize it. That's the other key. It's to contextualize the, the importance of that theoretical discovery for for your for your readership, for your audience. So it does take a level of imagination. And the second thing is, I would say, you know, really read the work of the people who've gone before you. Read the work of the people uh, that have gone before you. Because I honestly understood a lot about science communication from reading What is Life by Erwin Schrodinger, right? So we all know Schrodinger for his work on quantum, quantum physics and things like that, right? But he's a very interesting case. He's somebody who started out as a hardcore physicist and then decided he was interested in studying molecular biology. How did this man make that leap? How did he switch, literally? And he was actually, he was, he was, I, my, my professor in, during my master's course, who again was a physicist and then did molecular biology for a PhD. So imagine that. You, you study physics till, you know, your MSc, applied physics, and then suddenly you decide you want to do molecular biology. How, how do the principles even apply? How do you even apply that? How do you even think in that, in, in, in that manner? Right. But if you read something like what is life, it breaks down very, very kind of elegantly, I would say. Right. It breaks down. It's, 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 it's a difficult read initially. Right. But once, once you learn to appreciate it, Maybe the second or the third time you read it, you learn to appreciate what he's saying. Is that he actually connects? He actually, Irvin Schrodinger actually connects the whole pieces of where all the various elements of our sciences align with one another to give us a picture of what or or how our existence is made possible. He actually does that. I don't want to spoil the book for anybody, 
but read pieces like that read about how uh, what's the book uh, somebody asks and that is what is life the book's name is what is life by irvin shorenger you should read it it's a very thin book uh, and you can maybe finish it over the weekend it'd be well worth your time to read what is life and yeah read about read don't just read a, don't just read manuscripts read about pe how people discovered things read about einstein's life you know read about uh, you know the struggles people have had read about their discovery journey because somebody helped them break it down and when you read that you will get you will get an idea of how you are supposed to do it you will get an idea of how you could probably do it you will get the cue there you get the idea there i cannot possibly tell you uh, how best to communicate your research because i don't know it yet i haven't seen it right but like i said when you read that book you will identify the idea in your head as to you know this is the narrative i can adopt to communicate something that's basic and non translational so yeah so yeah it's for you and shiva yeah sure i think hina's screen is frozen yeah let my imagination run so wild that i you know uh, in an attempt to make my piece of research popular i connected with something that is contemporary i mean if i'm working on a protein uh, i'm working it on it in a completely different system but i know that that protein is also expressed in a cancer that is very a hot topic of research these days or maybe even covid-19 in case of the virus so is it really ethical to connect it to something so different just to be able to i know we know the answer but i would want you to discuss no, no, I'll, I'll uh, why you, I'll, we should or should yeah, so I'll, I'll i'll tell you what uh, and uh, i'll let shivani maybe take the second half of this uh, uh, i've i've seen this my entire career uh, with people jumping on the cancer bandwagon why are you studying this protein cancer what are you doing this for cancer what what is this going to fix cancer like i mean okay okay fine but but it will be a very very like faint connection to some pathway that could potentially stop some cancerous cell from replicating there's no actual real hefty kind of connection to the entire to the entire piece right so it's fine if you want to it's completely understandable if when you want to uh, you know jump a particular bandwagon like right now people want to jump the covid bandwagon that you know i have people will say you know you should consume this extract from this particular herb because covid 19 right but how realistic is that jump the question you have to ask yourself is how realistic is that jump is that a genuine jump uh, that, that is 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 there a genuine connection to making that jump or you're just making it because you can get a few eyeballs because that's not worth it it's not worth getting those three or four eyeballs you might as well say yeah this has nothing to do with covid this has nothing to do with anything mainstream this is completely new this is completely different right that might be more worth it so at the end of the day uh, you i think each individual researcher is best placed to understand what the relevance of their work is or where it connects to something contemporary right they know where to draw the line my only advice to you is and i can i can say this after being a very young sort of uh, sort of beaver-eyed researcher wanting to get my work published and have people talk about my work and making all sorts of jumps in terms of oh you look once i discover this i'm going to improve the way rice is harvested no it's not it's not going to improve the way rice is harvested it is maybe going to improve one variety of rice grown under very specific conditions and i was very eventually like 5 6 years later i realized that yeah maybe just saying that much was significant enough and it doesn't matter the other thing you have to remember is that you don't have to publish in some big high impact factor journal it's not going to happen to you on your first or second attempt it's not going to happen right somebody did an analysis on how much money and infrastructure and experience it takes to publish in a high impact factor journal above 10 right it's a significant number it's a significant number right at the end of the day you have to kind of as a research, and this is a philosophical thing you as a researcher have to be happy with what you've achieved like you should you should be happy and earnest in what you've achieved and be really be realistic about you know what the potential applications of it are so like i said don't jump the bandwagon for like three of you of you because that will last for a day or two weeks but uh will that really push your career forward will that give you a real will that give you any sort you you might as well just wait and take time like like i said good things take time so you might as well take time and come out with 
a piece of research that 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 really will establish you. So that's that's just my my perspective, Shivani. Yeah, that's I I totally agree with you. Uh, just 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 connecting the dots for the sake of connecting it is not going to go very long for you. And I think at some point, all researchers, all scientists understand the value of basic fundamental research. So. Yeah, when I started, I wanted something big picture. I wanted, oh, it needs to impact this, it needs to impact that. But what I landed up doing, for instance, was looking at the specific subset of immune cells in my body, okay, and how they are, how they are generated in certain scenarios. It was extremely niche and very, very basic. And that's fine. I'm totally proud about it. And I'll, I'll never try to hook it up. Yeah, maybe I try to, at some point in my you know, dissertation, I probably have written that there are uh, connections to you know, autoimmunity or cancer therapy or whatever. But that's not the crux of my story. That's not what I based my story on. So there's no harm in saying you know, in fine print somewhere that, yeah, these have bigger, larger implications. But as long as you're very clear that that implication is not within my study now, I think that's fine. So, yes, not everything. Yeah. And in ninety-nine point nine percent of people's eyes, it is still your discovery. It is still nobody will take that away from you. Even if it's a very tiny blip on the whole circle that is human knowledge, and you only made a small dent in putting it out. It's still your dent, right? Own it, own it. I'd rather have a really small discovery to my name, which nobody cares about, rather than being in a large conglomerate of 40, 50 people, right? And publish something and nobody knows. Like, I'd rather own that one discovery that is mine, truly mine, right? So whatever it is, no matter how small it is, own it. Don't feel like, and it happens in labs and institutes. You go into a lab and be like, I wish I had this study or I wish I had this model to work with or I wish I was working on this paradigm of, of, of the research problem. You don't have to. Whatever you're doing at that point in time, just do that well. Just do that well because whatever it is, it's yours and just own it and be proud of it. That's it. Yeah. So I guess not everything needs to be the next big cure for diabetes and cancer every day. Uh, just one last question and if I could request a very quick response from you, Shivani, on We've seen a lot of questions on, you know, how to take this up as a career. I mean, what if I just don't write about my research, but I want to write about others as well? Uh, is it only a science journalist job? Or if I'm a researcher now, how do I go about doing this in the future? So I think there's multiple ways of looking at it. Uh, if you want to write, right, if you want to become a journalist or a science communicator, that's a whole different, uh, I guess, career path. If you want to just be uh, I think there are you could be someone that a journalist reaches out to to talk about research in the field it doesn't have to be your research so that's that's a different thing so you're you're kind of like a point of contact for a for a journalist and you can talk about other people's researchers in that that path as well uh, but if you uh, if you really want to do science communication then you've got to be really good at breaking down, understanding all aspects of research, fundamental, uh, hardcore science, niche ones, across different fields, perhaps. Um, if you want to do science communication, there are several courses you can do. You can take up some writing courses. Maybe Shane might be a better person to answer this part. He has a better background experience on that. I've come across here just as experience and I, I pick up things every day. But if you want to do formal training, Shane, do you have any ideas? It's communication itself. Firstly, uh, like, like Shivani said, uh, there have been days where I've started my day looking at something uh, which has to do with computational, uh, computational physics, looking at a simulation in terms of how something is going to work out in a very specific condition, computational, like heavy, heavy stuff, Boolean algebra and stuff in it. Right, and then I've moved straight from there onto something that talks about a uh, like a genocidal uh, crisis in an African country. Right, so I you cover both topics in two hours. How do you how how do you kind of how do you comprehend that? Right. So the first thing you have to do to kind of be a science communicator is love science and not the subject. 
also it just to love the aspect of research and discovery you have to uh, you have to appreciate the more general aspects of it right so i am a plant molecular biologist by education and training right but i am no longer doing that i understand the motif that goes into research for me what i what you have to train yourself to do is understand and appreciate the motif that is in in that research study and then utilize that to tell or utilize that to communicate you cannot be attached to a subject you have to be you know attached to the science or the joy of discovery i think that's really important and the other aspect is yeah having great sort of written writing and sort of communication skills i think that is really really critical and like i said the best way to do that is to read as much as possible and to practice your writing as much as possible you know going beyond just publishing so you want you want to switch careers uh and 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 do something that's outside you know core academia you have to think about you 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 really have to start early and i think this is something even probably hina can tell you right it you have to, the the seed of that is planted in your mind when you're in your second year or your third year phd and you're like you know i like this i like this but i feel like i'm meant for something more and then you plant the seeds to do it right it doesn't just happen you can't just decide in your fifth year phd that uh, I'm, i mean i'm good i think i next want to jump off it it's not going to happen it's not i'm going to be a sassy it's not going to happen unless you have an insane amount of like natural ability right so you have to start today where you kind of you know practice your writing you pra- you read a lot you set time for yourself on the weekends to kind of study topics find out what's happening and to be interested in the field of science communication and what's being communicated globally right now that is important to be interested to be genuinely interested right because if you do that if you're interested then you will you will find ways you will find avenues and opportunities will come your way right so we keep looking for people all the time right uh, but it's very difficult to find that right mix of somebody who understands how science works and understands how communication works right and at the same time doesn't need a lot of time to do it right because anybody you give them two weeks to do something then anybody will summarize a paper in two weeks but i need it in two hours three hours maybe so any somebody to read and while they're reading and comprehending and making notes of how they're going to summarize it so yeah the so practice starts now if you if you really interested in taking that up as a career so yeah absolutely i mean uh, thank you shane for letting me add a word here i think degrees and certificates can take you only so far i mean uh, it's your practice and it starts well into your phd you need not wait uh for your phd to to end and then you start writing and looking for things and we are quite lucky that these days everybody loves a well rounded researcher instead of somebody who just you know works hard at the bench and doesn't look at the world outside so thank you uh thank you so much i think uh, this is the best wrap that we could have for this workshop uh if i could sum up we need to own our research uh and this we love the piece of work that we are doing we won't be able to talk about it uh and make people uh, pay attention to it uh thank you again shane and shivani uh i we can see from the audience response it was a wonderful session and uh before we wrap up i would take just one or two more minutes to talk about the india alliance fellowship programs uh as i mentioned india alliance is a in independent uh, dynamic public charity we fund research in biomedical and health communications uh excuse on behalf of hena i would like to uh, very quickly take you through our fellowship program uh, okay hena is back 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 to I you hena i don't realize i was off air uh, should i start uh, with the fellowships again
Uh, am I audible to you all? I'm not sure. Yeah. Hello. Okay, so I would just uh, take one more minute. Uh, I was talking about the India Alliance Fellowship Programs. We have funding opportunities in the forms of fellowships and grants for researchers. The fellowships are meant for individual researchers at different stages of their research career. We have early career fellowships for those in the early stages of their career who are looking to set up an independent uh, career for themselves. Intermediate fellowships for those who are looking to set up uh, a research group of their own. And senior fellowships who uh, for people who are established re uh, researchers and wish to expand their research program. Our fellowships are offered under two tracks, the basic biomedical research and clinical and public health research. A PhD is the minimum requisite that you need to apply to our fellowships. We also have grants called team science grants and clinical and public health research centers for groups of researchers. And then we f also uh, aim to promote research management in India through India Research Management Initiative. You can find these details on our website. Uh, if we could quickly move to the next slide. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this is a summary of the calls that are open right now. If you are a biomedical or clinical and public health researcher, you might want to check out application till 1st March. The clinic fellowships are open for applications beginning today uh, till 16th of uh, March. And then we have uh, the India EMBO lecture courses. So if you are a biomedical researcher and you want to host a lecture course in life sciences in India, the application deadline is 1st March 2021. I guess we have extended by quite a few minutes. So this uh, brings us to the end. One final announcement is that the certificate of the workshop will be issued to only those who submit the feedback survey. You must have received it or would receive it once we close the workshop. You will be redirected to the survey page as we end the uh, session. So I request you to please submit the valuable feedback. It would help us come back to you with improved uh, uh, sessions and content. Please know that it would take at least five to six working days for us to issue the certificates to you. This brings us to an end. Thank you very much for being an enthusiastic audience. Please take care and stay safe, all of you. And watch out for the recordings of the sessions today on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, all of you.